introduce our panel panelists for this first panel this afternoon. We'll talk about hot markets for international recruitment. So this will be a very interesting uh, discussion. Ryan Griffin is the director of the Office of International Admissions of the University of Missouri. He oversees both international undergraduate recruitment efforts and application processes and credential evaluations. Ryan has served in international admissions at Mizu since 2011, and during that time has represented the university in more than 30 countries and helped thousands of students from around the world to navigate the application process and become Missouri Tigers. Ryan earned bachelor's degrees in Latin American studies, marketing, and Spanish, as well as a master's degree in Spanish literature, all from the University of Missouri. He's an active member of the International Association of College Admissions Counselors, the Council of International Schools, the China Institute of College Admission Counseling, and the American Association of College Registrars and Admissions Officers, ACRA. He's also an active member and former chair for Region 4 of NAFSA and has presented on inter international recruitment and admissions topics at regional, national, and international conferences. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, Ryan. Thank you. Rash Singh, a program manager at the Center for International Education, Northern Arizona University, started his journey in the US as an international graduate student from India in 2006. He has worked in the higher education sector for more than 12 years, starting his career at State Fair Community College in Missouri as an academic advisor and adjunct faculty. He began his international higher education career at the University of Missouri, serving as the assistant director of international recruitment before transitioning to Northern Arizona University, where he currently serves as program manager, strategic global initiatives, focusing on recruitment and partnership development for South Asia. Thank you, Raj, for, for joining us today. And Patty, very good friend, Dr. Patricia Jusa, is the Associate Dean and Executive Director of Student Affairs and International Programs at the University of California, San Diego. Patty is an industry leader in international education. She's been recognized for her expertise in program development international partnerships, corporate training, accreditation, policy, pedagogy, curriculum development, international marketing and recruitment, crisis management, and advocacy. Piece of cake for Kathy. Anything you want, she's done it. She has held numerous leadership roles on international education boards, including UC, English USA, NAFSA Region 10, and New York State TESOL. Most recently, she served as UC president. She earned a Master's of Arts in TESOL from Teachers College, Columbia University, and a Bachelor's of Arts in Government from Cornell University. She has overseen continuing education auxiliary international education units at the University of Colorado Boulder and at Baruch College City University of New York. So thank you, Patty, as well, for joining us today. So without any... Um, Glaze at this point, turning it over to you. I believe Ryan, you're starting with the bigger picture, right? Yeah, thanks, Fernando. Um, and thanks to the whole MLA team. I uh, really appreciate you all putting this on um, and, and giving us a chance, uh, those of us in the field, to kind of come together and share some ideas. Um, speaking of which, to start, uh, we've got a short poll uh, today uh, just to kind of see where our audience members are coming from and what your uh, relationship with international recruitment looks like. Um, thankfully, you're gonna have between the three panelists today, a pretty um, wide range of um, recruitment areas uh, and responsibilities. So no matter what your engagement with international recruitment, we think we'll have uh, something that you'll be able to relate to with this. Uh, so to go ahead and get us started, I'm gonna pull up uh, my short slide deck here. So uh, as Fernando mentioned, um, Ryan Griffin, uh, the Director of International Admissions here at the University of Missouri. Um, in the US, we're pretty commonly known as Mizzou. Uh, our nickname is, is pretty well known here, so I'll probably flip back and forth between using those two. Uh, and similar to the, the poll questions that you're answering now, I also want to start out with a little bit of what our institutional profile and then uh, kind of where I'm approaching this topic from. Um, so University of Missouri, uh, large public school, uh, state flagship for our University of Missouri system. 
um, comprehensive degree offerings. Uh, so nearly 100 undergraduate degrees when we expand that out to master's and PhD programs, as well as uh, certificate programs, we're just shy of 300 uh, in total. Pretty large campus, uh, 31,000 students, with about 1,300 of those being international. Um, that is a number that has unfortunately come down over uh, the last five years. Uh, we did have nearly 8% uh, international a few years ago, and obviously now we're, we're looking more in that kind of 4.2% range. Um, 300 of those international students are at the undergraduate level, uh, and that's specifically what, what my team and I work with. Um, a little bit more on kind of our campus, so we do have a Center for English Language Learning. Um, they run our intensive English program, uh, as well as then we've collaborated with them to create our AIM uh, pathway program. That sounds for Academic Integration at Mizzou. Uh, so this is a program that was designed for students that are uh, don't quite meet our, our English language requirements, but at the same time, uh, we're able to kind of provide them uh, the opportunity to start academic work uh, while they're kind of bringing that English level up to what we'd want to see for, for overall admission and success on campus. Uh, and then our relationship with international recruitment is very focused on undergraduate. Uh, we do work a lot with CEL, our Center for English Language Learning. Um, back in the time before when we all jetted around and, and talked to students about our programs, uh, we would coordinate with CEL as well as our Office of Sponsored Students on programs on campus that works with uh, students that are coming from areas where there's government sponsorship programs, uh, so a very coordinated effort, uh, but most of that was again um, focused on undergraduate and, and English program students, uh, so not much in the graduate area. Um, we do not work with any educational consultants uh, or agents. So that does mean that while we've all been grounded, um, our recruitment efforts have been pretty limited to essentially what you're seeing today. Um, so a lot of Zoom, a lot of virtual recruitment. Uh, we, we don't have any in-country um, representation, so that has been limiting uh, in that fact. And then um, speaking of limitations, we do, uh, as a public institution, um, we're not able to offer any need-based aid to our uh, beginning international students. Uh, we do have some limited merit-based aid um, for reference, that covers maybe about 25% of our overall cost of attendance would be our top scholarships that we're able to offer. And then uh, we also have a, a fairly limited recruitment budget. Um, so back when we were doing active recruitment travel, uh, that really limited us to kind of um, our tier one uh, markets. So where we were able to have a presence um, was, was not quite as wide as we maybe would have liked. Um, but we were able to select and, and have some continuous efforts going on in, in several of our top markets. So um, now that we know a little bit about kind of where we're coming from, I uh, want to talk a little bit about what we've seen within our application numbers and, and what I would consider to be some, some hot markets um, between the 2021 and 2022 application cycles. The first one on the list that I have here, it feels like one that in the entire decade that I've been working in this field has kind of shown up on these sorts of lists, um, a, a perennial favorite, if you will. Um, but it is one that we do continue to see growth from, both in the number of applications as well as enrollments. Um, so Brazil is, is an area where I think that there is still a lot of growth. Uh, so again, this isn't gonna be some of the explosive growth that, that I'll talk about with some of the countries below, uh, but it has been incremental and steady, uh, at least on our campus. And uh, anecdotally, and with, with other members of the field that I've uh, kind of talked about this with, I think a lot of people are seeing kind of the same thing. Uh, it's also one where when we talk about virtual recruitment efforts, Brazil and, and I would say Latin America as a whole has been um, enthusiastic participants in, in some of the virtual events that we've done. I know that my team always looks forward to events that are going to be targeting um, targeting Brazil or targeting Latin America in general, just because of that student participation and enthusiasm factor uh, that we haven't always seen maybe from, uh, from all the markets where we're active. Now, when we wanna look at um, some real mind-blowing growth, at least in the terms of application numbers, uh, we can turn to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so for us, Nigeria um, it, it is actually now moved into one of the top five represented countries uh, on our campus, um, which is certainly a change. Uh, it's always one where we've had a fairly strong graduate um, number of students from Nigeria, but recently we've seen undergraduate interest and undergraduate applications really, really come on. Uh, we had a, almost a 300% year over year growth um, from the last year to last year, the fall 2021 application cycle. And you know, for us, this is still pretty early in the application cycle. We don't run any EA or ED programs. So we really start to see our applications 
come in a little bit more quickly in say November and December and, and as we wrap around to the new year. Um, but with what little bit that we do have in so far this year, Nigeria again is, is showing very strongly. Uh, so we anticipate even after that sort of growth last year that we'll probably see uh, growth again this year. Um, similarly for, for Ghana, um, another country there where, you know, before we had not really been able to do active on ground recruitment uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we hadn't um, been able to, it was kind of always on that next step or that next tier of markets where we wanted to be, uh, but we, we really would run out of budget before we were able to get there. So uh, being able to engage with these countries in the, in the virtual uh, recruitment market, we think is, is really starting to, to pay off. Um, and then Ethiopia, similarly. Um, so again, over 300% growth uh, in applications. So you know, really seeing a, a lot of interest um, coming from those countries. Moving a little further eastward, uh, Central Asia, and I just kind of put the, the region as a block here. Um, we would include certainly Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan within this, but for us, we've really seen the, the growth come out of Uzbekistan. Um, it was something where previously, you know, we, we really would only have maybe a handful of applications that would come in from there. Uh, so as a percentage, we, we could see really huge growth there, but we're still talking about a, a fairly small number uh, as compared to some of the more established markets where we've seen growth, but it is one that's now popping up on our radar much more frequently. Uh, and then to move south from there, uh, and again, um, this is a, another country when we think of India that certainly feels like it's been on these sorts of lists for as long as I can remember, um, and I think it, it continues to merit its spot there. Um, on our campus, it's actually the second most represented country uh, behind China, um, but it is one where at the undergraduate side, we're really starting to see a lot of traction there. Um, so it's always been a very big grad market. We've always had a, a strong Indian population on campus, but most of those were, were master's and PhD students. And now we're starting to actually see that uh, undergraduates are, are much more interested. Uh, so last year we had um, really almost a doubling of our application numbers uh, coming out of India. And despite the pandemic, despite everything else that was going on, we actually had strong numbers that were able to uh, enroll and show this fall. So India is another one that, again, kind of feels like Brazil and that it's, it's been hanging around. It's a little bit more of an established up and coming market, if that's even a term. Um, but I think it still merits, merits mention here. Um, Pakistan, this is one where prior to the pandemic, we had already started to see quite a bit of growth coming out of Pakistan, a lot more interest there. Uh, again, one where we had not really been able to do any in-person recruitment before, um, kind of always made that we'd like to go there list, but we never quite had the budget or the time to, to make that a reality. Um, so we've been really pleased to see uh, numbers there continue to grow up um, prior to the pandemic. And then last year, we continued to see that sort of an increase as well. Uh, Bangladesh, now we did have a small presence in Bangladesh. Um, it was often either the kickstart or the finish to a more full trip through India for us as far as in-person recruitment. Um, but we're now starting to really see some numbers come out of Bangladesh as well. Um, again, always had a, a bit more of a graduate presence on campus, but now we're starting to see it be an undergraduate option as well. Uh, and then probably similar to many campuses here, uh, Nepal is one uh, that also we've seen quite a bit of growth from here over the last couple of years. Again, kind of like um, Pakistan predates uh, the pandemic and, and virtual recruitment a little bit, um, but is one where we've continued to see that sort of an upslope uh, as, as we've progressed through uh, the last 18 to 20 months. So um, not to be completely contrarian with our, with our topic here of, of hot markets, but I do think that we wanna look at uh, what I've called potential coolers. And, and my photo is actually uh, ice cubes made of coffee, um, which seems an oxymoron to me, but I think there's certain challenges that come with some of these new hot markets or some of the growth that we've seen from, uh, from some of these countries. Um, I know my office in particular, we're actually right now um, down a couple of staff members, um, pandemic related, of course, with, with budgets that came there. And we mix that in with what has been a real overhaul and kind of turning over what our applicant pool has looked like and the countries represented there. And that's made for a couple of challenging situations. Um, so having to learn new, and I put new in quotation marks, obviously new to us is really what that looks like, or, or something that we just haven't had the experience with uh, working with those education systems uh, until all of a sudden you have uh, a real um, sizable population that comes from, from a country that maybe you're not familiar working with it. Uh, it's also one where, 
Of course, what we've been going through over these last 18 to 20 months in the, in the global pandemic, that's caused its own set of headaches. Um, so exam disruptions, um, cancellations, test centers needing to be closed. Uh, I, I mentioned English exams here, obviously, a lot of institutions, mine included, uh, needed to become uh, to adapt to the current uh, situation. Look at expanding what sorts of exams we accepted, uh, but then that also comes with its own um, kind of set of challenges, right? Making sure that you have your scores calibrated correctly there. I, I'm sure that I'm not alone that I, I know on my campus, we're really looking at some of those students that came in this fall and we have a close eye on what their performance is gonna look like here on campus. Uh, also what they've looked like on some of our entry English tests um, that we perform through our, our Center for English Language Learning here on campus to see if we have those levels set where we'd like them to be. Um, I imagine it's gonna be something that we're, we're probably all gonna be tinkering a little bit, uh, adjusting maybe up or down, depending on, on where you started out and, and where that may look like as you uh, adjust your, your, um, your admission requirements. Now, of course, also um, to add to the problems with new education systems is their calendars were also disrupted. So national board exams, when we think about India or even uh, multinational exams, when we think about the West African senior, um, uh, senior certificate. So some of these where what would typically be a, a key piece of a credential that we would wanna see from some of these countries, we know that those have been knocked off of schedule. Uh, so we don't want to punish students. We try to be adaptable, try to work with students to be able to get a good assessment of whether they would be a good fit on our campuses. But that's also been a, a moving target. Uh, so we've had to kind of work with, see what the reactions in different countries have been uh, for when these exams have moved, if they're going to be required, or if there are things that we can put into place uh, to get that same kind of feel for what, what these students may look like. It's also one where... Um, Many campuses and, and uh, many universities have, have gone to a test optional um, situation, uh, knowing that, again, students have not been able to sit for some of the typical exams. Uh, you know, that's one where at Mizzou, we have actually always been test optional for our international applicants, uh, but we still would see a fairly sizable percentage of students that would submit an SAT or an ACT. Uh, so learning to work with maybe a new educational system and then subtracting what could have been a, a key data point for being able to make those sorts of assessments uh, just means that we're going to be spending more time uh, with applicants from some of these countries, making sure that we have a fuller understanding of their readiness uh, to be on our campus. And then um, it's also one where I, again, would probably guess that I'm not alone in this, but all of our old uh, yield predictions feel like they are immediately antiquated. Um, and not just because of the pandemic and what came with that, but when we look at this sort of a shift in your applicant pool, um, then some of the things that we thought that we had known or, the, or markets where we were a little more familiar and could make some educated guesses about what that sort of yield would look like and kind of how the funnel would progress, um, that looks quite different now. Uh, so our applicant pool had prior to the pandemic really been running uh, very heavily Chinese. Uh, again, I don't think I'm probably alone in that. Um, but now that we've started to look and take what were some of our yield models and try and place those onto our new applicant pool, we're just seeing that there's, there's not really, um, you know, we're not able to make the, the sorts of educated guesses about what we're seeing. And that's going to be for a number of reasons. Obviously, the pandemic itself has been part of that. Uh, so students having issues with travel, students not being able to get visas. But then we're also seeing that when we move from, say, a, a more known entity like China, um, where we have a good idea of what um, the financial situation for many families that are applying, as well as that kind of knowledge and understanding of the cost of a U.S. education. And we move to, say, sub-Saharan Africa or, or countries where we're seeing a lower average GDP, as well as maybe a little bit larger information gap regarding what it looks like to study in the United States. Um, we are seeing that we're losing more students out of the funnel uh, at a little bit quicker rate than we have from, from other markets that we've known. So not to, to close on kind of a, a down topic there, um, but I think we'll, we'll still have plenty of things to talk about with the, with the hot markets here. And I'm going to go ahead and pass things over to Rob to uh, take over the second section. Hey Ryan, do you want to share the results of the poll? Yeah, that would be great. We're moving on. Excellent. It looks like we have a, a pretty good mix of um, those recruiting for graduate, undergraduate, intensive English, uh, extension programs, so a little bit of, of everything. And certainly high interest in institutional partnerships uh, with international partners. 
and then a pretty widespread here of um, just how we're kind of going about it. So like our panel, I think our audience has has a pretty wide representation of the field here today. So great, great to see. Yeah, you wanna go ahead, Rob? Perfect. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, thank you again, Fernando and the, the Michigan Language Assessment uh, uh, Center. And uh, we're excited to be here and uh, certainly being able to share our perspectives uh, from many different parts of the world in terms of uh, recruitment opportunities uh, as we see fit in this sort of post pandemic world or uh, whenever that would get started. Uh, my name is Rog Singh, and I'm the program manager here for Strategic Global Initiatives, uh, focusing on South Asia. So uh, my part of the presentation today would be focusing on some of the countries in South Asia, uh, with certainly a big focus on India uh, specifically. Uh, here at Northern Arizona University, we have uh, certainly seen a really good boost in terms of international student numbers uh, coming from the South Asia region. Uh, of course, uh, India is certainly the biggest of uh, these four countries that we have seen uh, in terms of the increase of our international student numbers. Uh, and I would say certainly both in perspective of graduate and undergraduate students, uh, I think the bigger increase certainly has come from the graduate side, which uh, in many ways is not a surprise since this region of the world, uh, particularly with India, Bangladesh, uh, and Sri Lanka, uh, we do see more graduate students come to the United States as compared uh, to the undergraduate side. Uh, so that's just a perspective on things. And now we'll sort of get into uh, uh, some of those perspectives. And of course, how did we sort of get here? Uh, we've seen a strong boost of uh, increase in applications also uh, uh, in our graduate numbers. Uh, again, South Asia certainly has a big part in this. Uh, and, and keep this in mind as we have seen these increases uh, Northern Arizona University is not part of the common application. We're not part of the coalition application. We have our own application system, which is here uh, through CollegeNet. So it's certainly uh, promising to see these increases uh, in application and, of course, uh, in student numbers, uh, particularly during these challenging times. Now, one element of this, of course, has been that uh, previously uh, we had someone who was uh, processing our graduate application specifically for international students, was in the graduate school uh, a couple of years back. We made that transition uh, and we were able to bring that personal within uh, the Center for International Education, where our international admissions office is. And I think the coordination in that respect certainly made things uh, a lot more smoother uh, in terms of not only getting more applications, but being able to complete those applications uh, and getting to see those students admitted uh, and eventually seeing them on campus. So certainly some of those changes uh, that we have made here at NAU that certainly has helped us increase in applications, particularly on the international graduate side uh, and coming from South Asia. Now, in terms of opportunities, I'll start my focus with India. Uh, you know, as Ryan said, of course, India has been on the map in terms of international recruitment uh, for many, many years for most of our institutions who are in international student recruitment. I do see this moment uh, for India as sort of a reincarnation in some ways when it comes to international student recruitment. And I do have some specific reasons for that. Uh, certainly this year itself, when India was facing some of its most challenging times, uh, in regard with COVID uh, and many of the issues on the ground. Uh, we had an administration here in the United States, uh, which was able to work uh, with authorities in the ground. And the US mission in India was able to come up with some of the largest number of visas they have given uh, in quite some time. And certainly uh, that number here for 2021 was close to 55,000 visas. Uh, for many of you who are involved in recruitment in India, you would remember that essentially till end of June, many of these consulates and embassies were closed. And essentially by June, uh, July 1st week, uh, things started to change around and people were able to certainly get their uh, student visa appointments. And many of us saw a number of international students uh, coming from India this particular semester. I think, you know, geopolitics is something uh, which has always been attached with international higher education. Uh, and India is one of those countries, whether if you take a Republican or Democratic administration, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the relationship has been quite good. And that certainly has made the case where in many parts of the world, 
earlier in the spring semester in you know December of 20, uh, 20 January 2021, when uh, consulates and embassies were still shut down, India was able to issue visas uh, for many of these international students to come down to the United States. So I do think that geopolitics and the relations certainly play a big part and India certainly uh, seems to be enjoying that perspective where even though COVID certainly has made things quite challenging on the ground, uh, the relationship between the two administrations, uh, more recently, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi visiting the United States, uh, certainly has helped India in that regard. Now, the second element I think where uh, the US uh, certainly can do better than India has been in part where many of these students who used to pursue uh, you know, higher education, looking at options in Australia and Canada, uh, due to challenges of being able, not being able to travel to those parts of the world, suddenly started looking as the U.S. as one of the most prominent options. The last few years, while uh, you know, U.S. may not have been at top of the list for many students in India, and we certainly saw that with the huge increase in international students in Canada and Australia coming from India, things started to change around once again because of those governmental policies the fact that students from India still could fly into the United States. Uh, we had vaccinations for these students available on our campuses. Uh, there was a plan that these students could return and new students could come. I think all of these perspectives certainly brought United States back to the top of the map when for a prospective student who may have been considering to study abroad, but may not have been exactly clear where they would like to go. So I think these perspectives are important to consider because I do think that governmental regulations and policies play a big part uh, in terms of recruitment opportunities, visa regulations, uh, and things that we have uh, uh, in the future in terms of hot markets. You know, India, of course, so there's no surprise, is a very much a graduate market, very much STEM-driven, uh, particularly with the change of OPT policies that we saw in 2016. Uh, you know, it really has given the United States an uh, upper hand in terms of many of these students coming here and being able to utilize that experiential learning opportunity for up to three years after uh, you know, graduating from our school. So if you're looking to really recruit in India, uh, you know, I think the graduate markets are certainly hot, uh, but even the STEM-focused programs, and this is where we are seeing a number of institutions you know, being creative uh, to some extent, uh, and now introducing many programs in business analytics, to MBA, and so on, which has a STEM particular focus, uh, with this recruitment perspective in mind. The other aspect that we have seen, of course, is you know, as much as we admission officers would love to connect with students uh, and share our perspectives, a lot of our graduate students and prospective students are more probably interested in listening to the opportunities coming from our faculty in terms of research or similarly to career services. This is very true in India, uh, where there's a very big focus in terms of those experiential learning opportunities in terms of career services beyond their degree. Uh, and that's where collaborating with our colleagues from career services uh, certainly has helped us bringing in that more attention and so on. You know, one of the big debates about India has been, you know, uh, certainly it's, uh, you know, easier to get into international schools. That's where you have many times guidance counselors, easy to make that appointment, webinars and so on. But then you have this huge population of prospective students who are in those national and state curriculum schools, and yet uh, they may not have those same opportunities to interact directly with US admission officers. I think this is where the debate sort of you know, comes into perspective of having country-based representatives, or perhaps even having partnerships with educational consultants on the ground. Uh, again, uh, recently, earlier in this year, we saw through a survey that was done by NACAC and AIRC, that out of the 294 institutions that participated, about 49% uh, do actually work with agents. So what has certainly happened is now, particularly in these pandemic times, is that as we are looking for those allies on the ground, whether through a country representative or certainly through educational agents and consultants, uh, that certainly has uh, given an opportunity beyond uh, the Zoom sessions, beyond the webinars of still being able to connect with those students or parents on the ground face to face. Building of partnerships uh, is certainly another element that we're seeing in India. Uh, this has been certainly quite successful for many of our colleagues and peers uh, who have built such partnerships in China with two plus two, three plus one, one plus two plus one programs. 
Uh, I think this is also the age where international higher education is going to transition into more transnational education, at least from the US perspective. I think the UK, Australia have been doing many such programs where students start in their home countries and then coming down uh, to their uh, destination where they're studying abroad. But I do think now more and more US universities through those partnerships are going to be looking at similar transnational opportunities as well. Um, as we move ahead, uh, similarly, uh, talking a little bit more about opportunities in South Asia, you know, Bangladesh is another country where we have seen some growth, particularly again on the graduate side. Uh, one big element of Bangladesh is the fact that uh, the, the GDP uh, has been one of the strongest ever, uh, in fact, even stronger than India. And if you go back and actually interestingly take a look at serious by the data numbers and particularly look at the number of uh, the visas that have been offered in all these different countries, uh, there certainly was a drop in terms of number of visas issued F1, uh, J1, particularly uh, to many of these countries in the last few years. But Bangladesh constantly kept growing and never went sort of uh, saw any kind of declines. So with a strong economy and uh, certainly a big interest in studying abroad, I do think uh, Bangladesh is a wonderful place to recruit, particularly if you're looking uh, for those promising graduate students. In terms of recruitment, I do see a major shift happening. Um, you know, I think gone are those days uh, when we are perhaps going into school, setting up those tables, uh, and perhaps talking to those students, uh, parents directly, particularly in South Asia. You know, where you have these massive populations and where you attended these fairs, um, you know, you were just filled up with, uh, you know, room full of people. I do think now recruitment is going to be more yield focused, uh, perhaps because of, you know, uh, budgetary changes with higher education institutions. Uh, and that's where we might be going and visiting many of these students more at the point of time when they're already admitted in those smaller groups, perhaps meeting with their parents or even having those smaller receptions since schools may not be willing to accommodate us into those uh, large size sort of recruitment fairs that we have done in the past. Going back to the country representative agents uh, as partnership model, I think uh, you know, India is big in this particular perspective. I think as many of you who have traveled uh, to India, to Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka in many of these cases, even though there has been an increase in international schools, a lot of times in these international schools, you see uh, a fairly small number of guidance counselors compared to the population of students that are working. Uh, and unfortunately, many of these guidance counselors are not able to pay that uh, attention to all of their students. And that's where we see, you know, this sort of vacuum has created the need for agents, educational consultants, uh, and certainly many universities working with that. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, you know, if I'm a pro agent or against agent, certainly my institution certainly works with agents. And I do see, uh, you know, uh, with more and more U.S. universities uh, probably going to increase that partnership. And honestly, this is not something new. Uh, universities in Australia and Canada have been doing this. And these are among many reasons why they have seen great success in India, uh, being able to get to those second and third tier cities rather than just sort of going into those metropolitan cities with those connections there. I think with these hot markets, we're also seeing the utilization of more alumni and current students. Uh, sometimes it may be hard to travel with faculty as much as we would love to take faculty there, but having uh, you know, your past alumni, your current students who may go back to visit their family, uh, utilizing them for those yield events uh, is going to be another opportunity to be able to see recruitment uh, in slightly a different perspective. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, as we have talked about these admission funnels, you know, getting started with students at recruitment fairs, going through the application and admissions process. As we see larger competition, I think that admission funnel is going to get transformed to the fact that we will need to constantly communicate with these students uh, to the point where they're coming to our campus, making sure that we, you know, give them a warm welcome through a well-organized orientation helping them with you know, housing and other opportunities and so on. So I do think uh, there is sort of a prolonged sense of that admissions funnel where we're now seeking basically each student as they're arriving on campus uh, as well. Uh, moving on to my next slide, uh, you know, I think a lot of these opportunities as we talk about recruitment also goes back to what are we doing on our campuses with our current students because they're certainly big ambassadors in terms of our recruitment opportunities. Uh, and here at uh, NAU, we have certainly utilized this opportunity of rebuilding our base. Uh, 
uh, with India, we started a web series called Cello NAU, uh, which particularly focused on our current students from India, our faculty, um, as well as our staff. Uh, who are working with our students from that part of the world and how they could help them uh, while they arrived here at NEU. We started a cricket club here at NEU because we knew that if there was one thing that could bring all of South Asia together, it was certainly the sport of cricket. Uh, and that certainly has been fantastic as we have seen our uh, you know, a former student organization, uh, you know, uh, which uh, we saw in the case of Indian student organization and so on. Now certainly sort of taking the lead also with the Jack's Cricket Club and that has been fascinating. Uh, there's been a huge interest in terms of career opportunities uh, last year, we launched our first uh, International Career Week, which focused on uh, the requirements that international students were looking at uh, in terms of finding opportunities, in terms of CPT, OPT, and so on. And then, of course, you know, organizing those cultural events, because eventually, uh, as students are looking at uh, your particular university, uh, your own ambassadors are certainly the best people to talk and advocate about the opportunities prospective students have when they arrive on campus. And being able to have these resources and opportunities certainly helps uh, and connect with these future students uh, who beyond rankings, beyond locations, are certainly excited to see that they can find their little homes uh, in a destination beyond their uh, home countries uh, when they come to the United States. Uh, so that's my part of uh, the presentation. And on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and give it ahead to Patricia. Okay. Uh Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I, uh, I'm Patty Yuza from the University of California, San Diego. And uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about hot markets, particularly for non-degree programs. Start off with just a, a short institutional profile. Of course, San Diego is in Southern California. This is a very, large comprehensive R1 institution with you know a lot of uh, international and national uh, rankings which certainly in general makes it a, a little bit easier to to recruit for and and to attract uh, ministries of education and and other sponsors and and funding agencies um, the other thing i want to point out of course is um our campus on the degree side is ranked number eight uh, in the IIE Open Doors uh, metric for enro total enrollment of international students. Um, currently, we have over 11,000 degree and OPT students on, on our main campus. And in some sense, this is a little bit of a challenge for us because more recently in the state of California, there's new legislation, which is now going to um, uh, restrict the proportion of out-of-state non-residential international students on our campus. So right now it's about 20%. Um, it's going to go down to about 18%. So we have lots of international students in our bachelor and master and PhD programs, predominantly from from China, but that proportion is going to change. Um, and of course, our campus is continuing to look at diversifying itself. Um, but on the extension side of how the house, of course, we don't have any, uh, in, in, any limits to the numbers of students uh, whom we can recruit. So I just wanted to share um, some of the areas, there are a lot of usual suspects on this list, but some of the areas where we uh, continue to see either growth or um, a renewal of interest and also student enrollment. Um, I'll start off with the Gulf states. Of course, the price of oil has gone up <laughs> since the start of the pandemic. Um, so there is a bit more funding available for students for non-degree study. Um, we're of course not seeing the numbers as they were in the past, but we have seen an um, uptick particularly from um, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, especially for our English language programs um, and opportunities for foundation year programs um, based in, uh, from the Gulf states. Um, in terms of Latin America, like the, 
you, you know, like colleagues from the degree side of the house, we're also continuing to see lots of interest from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and, and Mexico. And of course, um, there's some challenges there, uh, you know, due to the pandemic and, and uh, political conditions in some of these countries and also the local economies. But the interest remains robust, and we have seen students from these areas throughout the pandemic, but now that some of the travel restrictions have been removed, we're seeing an increase in interest uh, and, and enrollment, and I'll get, get to that in a little bit. Um, in terms of Asia, yes, we're also seeing interest in India, particularly for um, short-term certificate programs that can be um, stacked on a local certificate, say in India, and where students may come to campus and either complete that certificate in partnership with us, or they complete a certificate in India and then they do an additional one in the US. Um, anything that's workforce uh, related, um, which leads to OPT, especially with uh, short term programs, is also an area of interest. So you know, as, as others have said, there's been an increase in interest at the undergrad level. We've always seen lots of interest at the grad level, but among working professionals, there's also an interest in certificate study. Um, continued interest from Japan, especially for next year, Kazakhstan, Taiwan, and also Vietnam. And then for Europe, uh, for non-degree study, where we continue to see robust interest and increased enrollment are for short-term visitor programs. These are like non-exchange um, exchange, non -exchange study abroad opportunities, um, especially when your institution has partnerships with numerous universities in these countries. Um, where there's a long-term relationship or, or in some cases uh, interest from, from, uh, with new partnerships, um, the Europeans have been sending students. Um, you, you know, they were one of the first areas where we saw um, people being vaccinated on a wide scale, um, numbers of COVID cases go up and down in some of these areas, but um, these students, at least for this year and next, are not showing as much a risk aversion and are interested in studying at uh, a US university, you know, a quarter or a semester. Um, I'll also say that some of the travel restrictions that were imposed for Australia and New Zealand, um, which, which sort of closed their doors for a while to international students, um, students from European countries who might have gone to Australia or New Zealand to study, um, have those students are now coming to the U.S. at least at least for now. Then I want to talk about some of the some of the considerations that have come come up. Um, of course, easing of of travel restrictions more recently um, that we've seen some of these some of some of the countries come off. Um, the restriction list, like the Schengen area countries, um, but there are new travel conditions being imposed, of course, with vaccine requirements and continued testing of travelers. We saw more recently, I don't know if it was today or, tomorrow, or yesterday, uh, where the U.S. opened the the land border uh, with Mexico and Canada. So we are seeing some ease of travel restrictions and conditions, and that the the, the real the reality of that and the perception of that ease of travel um, is certainly having an impact. And we are hearing from agent partners and individual students who are interested in, in coming and doing short-term study. Um, of course, um, visa interview waivers, which may have come up uh, yesterday as well, um, that's also uh, reduced um, some of the barriers and obstacles um, for students to obtain their visa or renew their visas um, in order to come and study. And that's playing out in some of the matriculation numbers. I mentioned oil prices. This is of course something that we'll all continue to follow. None of us wants to overly rely on one area of the world, but um, 
the, 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 oil, the oil prices being where they're at right now certainly uh, bodes a little bit better, especially for English language programs that uh, rely on some of the oil producing nations for some of their enrollment. Um, risk aversion and managed risk taking, you know, with non-degree study, it's shorter term, of course, by nature. And so, um, you know, over the past year, students and their families may have been a little bit more reticent uh, to go abroad for a short-term program where you may in fact wind up being fully online uh, or partly online. Um, and, and now that we see that things are a little bit safer, of course, um, you, you know, we're seeing a little less risk aversion and more, more um, interest in managed risk taking. So of course, um, students and families and agents and partners from those hot countries that I mentioned uh, for, for non-degree study, they wanna know how your campus is handling vaccination requirements and masking and how safe is it? What are the COVID numbers? But we're seeing students get antsy. You know, they don't wanna wait any longer to come and study. Some of them have delayed and delayed. Um, and so for 2022, we're starting to see, again, an uptick in interest and applications. We've seen an increase in yield um, for, for the fall quarter as well. Um, and then, of course, something to consider, and this is always true, but especially now, our ability to develop new programs and partnerships faster than, faster than ever, right? Um, there's... Uh, increased requests for very customized, tailored uh, training, if you will, um, sometimes in partnership with other institutions. Um, I, I think, uh, you, you know, a colleague from Temple University was quoted the other day as saying, English plus, you know, English plus anything right now uh, seems to be of great interest. And we're, we're noticing that as well. Um, but also for non-English programs, certificate programs, short-term executive program training, uh, whether that be from, from China or uh, Brazil or, or India. Um, and then, of course, internships and work opportunities. You know, there's a lot of data from ISIF Monitor and other sources um, that report uh, for, for working professionals, um, they appreciate their recreational short-term programs, but a lot of people, whether they're new to the field or if they are seasoned working professionals, have interest in hands-on work opportunities. So to the extent that we are providing internship opportunities with some of these, for some students uh, and, and professionals from these countries, we've seen uh, an increase in interest. And that is something that we are uh, spending a lot more time on developing longer term local partnerships um, to ensure substantive internships uh, for students. Uh, of course, we're also cautious of any um, visa issues or processing concerns with OPT. We know backlogs of uh, uh, processing can also um, be a deterrent or a hindrance uh, as well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for wonderful insights, Ryan, Rack, uh, Patty. Great. Lots of things that are you have in common. Everybody mentioned India, for example, and some kind of markets that are not surprising, that are still hot. And um, all of you mentioned specific things that are particular to your uh, context. Great ideas. We have a few questions yet, yet um, from the audience. There was one for Ryan. Um, sounds like you're not offering much scholarship money for undergrads, but you are getting a lot of applications from these countries. Can you be more specific about the actual yield of students coming from those countries? Yeah, so, so to give a little context, um, specifically when, you know, kind of prior to the pandemic, we had our yield typically set between about 20 to 24 percent, um, and that was pretty steady for, for a number of years. Uh, it's dipped the last few years. This last fall, uh, we, we got down to about a 14.6 percent yield, 
Um, and so when we're looking at some of these countries, you know, a lot of this is directly attributable to the shift in our applicant pool. Um, so we, you know, used to yield uh, typical Chinese freshman and undergraduates at somewhere around a, a 26 to 30% clip. Um, when we look at some of these countries, I, I just pulled our numbers on Nigeria, as I saw this question come up, 4.8% uh, yield. Um, you know, India is a little more stable. We're around 10% with our yield there. Uh, Brazil is, is going to look somewhere actually about right on our average, 14 or 15% where we were for the year. Um, but we do see that with some of these countries, you are going to have a, a you're going to do more work um, for less enrollments. Um, and I think Rob kind of alluded to this in, in his comments as well, that students now in, in the world that we're in um, have become more comfortable with the idea of wanting a one-on-one -on -one Zoom, of wanting a little more personal attention. Um, and so it is one where that's going to be required, that's going to be necessary all the way from pre-applicant prospective student, I think, like Rob mentioned, all the way through to actual arrival on campus. Um, so it is one where we're kind of being stretched for time within that. And we're still kind of developing on how, how do we take this information that we know where we may have a less hot prospect, um, you know, we may say, and, and, and how do we then make sure that our resources are kind of being spent in the right direction? It's a great question. <laughs> um, if anyone has the answer to that one, uh, let, let me know, because we're, we're certainly still looking. Thank you. And there are two related questions. How do you use technology for recruitment and how, what role does social media play in your recruitment process? Sure. So Fernando, I'd be happy to jump in about that. Uh, you know, in terms of social media, certainly I think it has uh, been a, a big element in terms of recruitment, particularly during the pandemic times. You know, we're all utilizing Zoom, but going beyond Zoom, um, you know, I think one good example was the case of Cello NAU. Uh, we were certainly looking that India looked very promising to us and we wanted to do something specific to that brand. Uh, and that's where we sort of came together, you know, build a web series uh, where on a monthly basis, we looked at, okay, for this particular population, what are they exactly looking at when they're coming to NAU uh, in terms of connecting with students, in terms of connecting with career services, in terms of connecting with faculty members from certain programs that they may be more interested in. That certainly uh, has been quite well uh, taken, but I also do think WhatsApp is huge in India. Uh, being able to constantly connect through WhatsApp has been a huge blessing. Uh, it has been so much easier to get a reply back from a student uh, through WhatsApp and not just through students. I think a lot of times, you know, prospective student, uh, you know, parents reach out to us. Uh, the conversation may start with the WhatsApp and then may turn into a phone call. So I do think, you know, sort of utilizing technology with their utilizing at home, on the ground uh, and adapting to that certainly uh, plays well, I would say, yeah. Excellent. Addy, anything about social media or technology? Well, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to Raj and Ryan related to that. Um, to what extent are you engaging alums, international alums in your social media strategy? Because that's something that, we have been trying to strategize about and plan and, and you know, right. the most appropriate platform. So I was just curious how, how alums fit into both of your, you know, both at NAU and also at Mizzou. That was going to be my next question, how you were involving alums. <laughs> Perfect, yes. Thank you. Who wants to start? Yeah, so I could get started. Um, so in the past, uh, last year, when we did our sort of first International Career Week, uh, and the focus was, again, on international students and understanding that they have this sort of need of looking at opportunities beyond their degree, uh, we were able to invite a number of different alumni, uh, and that certainly played well, I think. Uh, in fact, we opened up that International Career Week to our prospective students. Uh, we wanted to sort of give them a glimpse of the resources that NEU has to offer uh, when they come here to campus, uh, getting to hear from our current students, our former students, and that certainly helped. Uh, similarly, I think we're looking at opportunities where we know like traveling for us or traveling even with faculty may get challenging. So looking at uh, opportunities on the ground, coordinating through our country representatives, or working with our alumni through education agents. Uh, I think finding all those resources certainly has been the key and even featuring our alumni on our social media because we know as our students are looking at that, uh, seeing where our you know, former students have gone for graduate school or perhaps working in a full-time role uh, certainly is something that they would love to know more about. 
Yeah, pretty similar here. And it seems that the career outcomes piece has become a larger and larger focus for families in particular, if not the student themselves. Um, so one of the focus points for us on our social media, um, we've gone through, looked at graduates, uh, especially graduates that we've kind of maintained contact with, may have been someone who perhaps worked in our office or was engaged somewhere on campus or where they had a, kind of a higher profile. Um, so staying commun communicative with them um, and then maybe putting out a profile, um, getting to do uh, a short write-up. We're, we're actually working on one right now for our WeChat account from one of our recent Chinese grads um, who landed a, a wonderful job and is having a great uh, start to their career. Um, so being able to kind of put out a profile piece like that is um, kind of probably where we're active the most. Um, it's one where as far as getting alums to, to interact more and, and find more of a role within that recruitment process. We're still exploring ways for that. Um, but, but to kind of throw back, I know Rog had mentioned this earlier, I know one of the great things with uh, kind of the move to Zoom is we've now been able to have faculty co-present with us. So if I'm doing a presentation and we know that it's going to be something that's STEM focused, maybe I grab someone from our mechanical engineering department to, to come and talk about their latest piece of research they're probably not flying to Brazil with me or not going to be able to, to make it, you know, take a week off and come to China to do a series of, of visits. Um, ask them for 20 minutes on an afternoon for a Zoom call, much more reasonable. And so it's, it's been a little bit easier to, to integrate some pieces like that within, um, within the, you know, what we're doing now. And certainly I think that's something that'll probably last beyond this, even if we do go back to uh, perhaps a more travel centric uh, recruitment process. Great. Um, agents were mentioned several times during some of the sessions yesterday, today. What recommendations, and I see that from the poll also, that several either were already using agents and increased uh, work with agents. There are a few that you, institutions that are not working with agents at this point. What recommendations do you have for those that are beginning or increasing the, the work with agents? What advantages have they provided for your relationship with like, you know, recruitment purposes and relationship with potential applicants? And what kind of special tips do you have? Anything to consider to really build a positive relationship with them and making sure that you're partnering with the right agent that will support your specific uh, programs? Raj, do you want to go first on that? Uh, sure, happy to. Um, so I think one of the things that, you know, I would recommend personally for institutions that are just getting started to work with agents is start small. I think, uh, you know, uh, agents sometimes can be a little overwhelming in terms of the questions <laughs> you may have uh, and the doubts and the concerns. And so I, I would definitely recommend going small, perhaps starting with five to six agents, depending on how you feel comfortable in a particular region. A lot of these agents that we're looking at uh, are sort of now in a, you know, in a conglomerate uh, sort of uh, organizational perspective, uh, you know, who may have presence in many different parts of the world. Uh, so I think focusing on a few agents constant communication, perhaps even having uh, monthly meetings, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a quarterly newsletter, the more information you can provide, the more you're communicating, that certainly helps. And then even while you're, uh, you know, traveling or uh, hopefully if you get to travel in the near future, uh, getting to go see them in their offices, see what kind of structure they have, uh, you know, how are things there on the ground and so on. So I think all of those resources, the more you connect, the more you communicate, uh, you know, you take away the opportunity for misinformation that sometimes is often the case when working with uh, educational consultants. Yeah, I, I, I might add to that if you're just starting off, um, one good recommendation would be to consider membership in ARC, the American International Recruitment Council. Um, tons of great resources and support from that organization and a lot of experience higher, U.S. higher ed, ed institutions that have been working with agents over a long term. I think having a very clear and transparent uh, vetting process uh, for your agents is really key. Um, identifying those criteria that you think are important for when selecting an agent and also helping to manage their expectations through that great uh, communication that Rock was just talking about, um, newsletters, ongoing training sessions and virtual webinars and, and training manuals and making sure that they're up to date on absolutely everything and, and giving them updates on their individual students and clients, how well that they're 
succeeding in their program. What countries have you seen declining in terms of international students going to your institutions? China has been the, the one where we've seen the most, um, most decline. Mm -hmm. Adi, Rad? Yeah, for us, yeah. again, China, of course. Uh, you know, we used to have a number of our students uh, coming from Sri Lanka. Um, I wouldn't say there has been a decline, uh, but there has been a change. Uh, a lot of these students used to previously come here on campus. Now we have some sort of online programs uh, where they're still part of NAU, uh, but they're finishing their sort of, you know, uh, the two years of education back home. So I would say a different kind of student in some regard. Yeah, I, I would say China for our extension programs, uh, non-degree programs, probably for, for our degree programs, the Chinese numbers are still relatively high at our, at our campus, um, but uh, China and perhaps South Korea too. Um, we've seen some declines. And, and I would probably also add in uh, some of the Gulf states. I, I know that you had mentioned earlier, Patty, is, is certainly being a, an opportunity right now for short-term programs, mm -hmm. degree programs. Um, we've really seen our numbers from Saudi Arabia uh, go down as some of the scholarship support there had um, kind of been curtailed and, and pulled back a little bit from, from the glory days uh, of a few years ago. From, from the countries that you, like the hot markets that you've been talking about, uh, for this fall, for the 2021, 2022 applications that you're seeing now, what is the one country that has surprised you the most? And what do you think, like in terms of higher uh, number of applications that you've been receiving that you were not expecting in those numbers or in that proportion? And what do you think that accounts for? Is it due to anything that you're doing that you're kind of any specific recruitment efforts that are paying off or they're just, they're, there are many factors that affect those decisions sometimes. Uh, I'd be happy to jump in. So Bangladesh is, I think, one country in South Asia that certainly has surprised me in some ways. I think just the last couple of years, uh, being able to visit there, uh, you know, I think when you show up to their Education USA office, there's just so much interest. Students are so enthusiastic. Uh, there's a lot of hunger and interest in the United States. Uh, and, and I think the Education USA team has done an exceptional job. Uh, so we've definitely seen a lot more interest and increase in that area. And that certainly uh, is parallel to the fact that they have one of the strongest economies in South Asia. And interestingly, uh, even a couple of years back where we saw visa numbers decline, Bangladesh sort of kept going and certainly has. So I, I do see uh, a lot more opportunities. And now institutions in Bangladesh even looking up uh, to uh, those uh, partnership opportunities in terms of two plus two and even some uh, starting even at the, the secondary school level. So I think uh, that's definitely a great opportunity for uh, future years. And we have certainly seen some good increases as well. Yeah, I, I kind of mentioned in my section earlier that um, Nigeria is one that in this very young application cycle, we're seeing that it looks like it's gonna kind of hold up those almost incredible, um, unbelievable type of growth numbers that we've seen from the previous couple of application cycles. Um, India looks like it's certainly continuing to grow uh, for us as well. Um, so those are probably the two that I would say that certainly look to kind of continue the trend that, we, that we've seen over the last few years. Uh, it's I, I think we were a little surprised by Japanese numbers. Not that we hadn't been seeing large numbers before, but, but we know that um, because uh, the Japanese government had sort of um, paused study abroad programs from universities for the year, we were surprised by the number of individual Japanese students who were still applying for programs. So that, that was a kind of a surprise for us. Another question came for, for you, Patty. What kind of visa do the non-degree short-term program students have? F, B? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. Um, depending on who you ask in, in, the, in the US government, you'll get a different answer. Um, but um, for short-term full-time study, it's generally an F visa if it earns credit, which is transferable to some sort of program like a degree or a certificate, it should be an F. 
for um, more recreational, avocational, or cultural uh, type program or an academic type camp for adults or for um, high school students that can be done in B status or ESTA, right? Uh, uh, there's another related question here, which is why would a student come for a non-degree program? And is there an opportunity for students to stay in, a U in the US as a permanent resident afterwards? That's a really excellent question. So um, for certificate programs in some short-term study, if the student completes a program that's the equivalent of an academic year, they may be eligible for OPT. So we have um, three-quarter three quarter based um, business certificate program. So for a student in that situation, they can qualify for OPT to um, work in, in the US and, and some uh, do wind up getting an H-1B and, and then going on and, and uh, filing for a green card later on. So it is, it, is, um, it is possible to do that. And there are some students who, working professionals in particular, who are interested in that route um, or, or doing a pause, right? They might come for an academic year certificate program, get some work experience, and then apply for a master's or a PhD program. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Something we were discussing yesterday also related to new markets in, in some way. Uh, how do you explore new markets? Uh, of course, you want to make sure that you're kind of investing in the markets that will produce the results that you're expecting, but there's always a way to, to explore new possibilities and seeing where kind of you can find a new opportunity with different, either for some programs in particular, for uh, types of certain demographics that you're aiming at, or what do you do to add to your planning process, how to either in terms of budgets or resources or strategies, what do you do in, in that planning process to consider potential new markets that will be hot in the future? Yeah, so for us, Anna, we, we always look um, to Education USA uh, with any new markets to get a, an introductory uh, piece for understanding that educational system, um, what students uh, there have typically gone on to study. We'll also look back at our, our own applicant pool. Um, so again, looking at the secondary schools that those students are coming from, um, where do we need to maybe reach out and make those connections, which counselors we need to um, get on a first name basis with and, and start to look at, you know, being able to, to visit there. Now in the virtual setting, this has um, actually become a little bit easier. Again, there's, you know, such a low barrier to entry for anyone to kind of set up a, a Zoom panel and, and, you know, jump in and invite some students to join you. Um, and so that's been great. Uh, and so now what we're doing is also then going back and looking at where has that interest kind of been sustained? Um, where was it, um, you know, something where we're, we're still drawing, um, you know, fairly decent crowds if we're, say, putting on a presentation with three or four other AAU universities where we, where we do an open webinar? Um, what do those numbers look like for us then deciding where we're going to kind of sustain efforts um, to, to stay within a market? Perfect. Thank you, Ryan. I would say, I think uh, for us, one aspect that has been really beneficial is looking for those sort of uh, key partnership opportunities uh, and certainly having both country representatives and partnerships with educational consultants on the ground uh, helps us often to connect with higher education institutions uh, or other organizations which may be looking for such uh, you know, uh, international partnership opportunities. And I do think that as economies fluctuate, as there are challenges with visa regulations or students being arriving here on campus, uh, finding those key partnerships is going to be the key. Uh, I think in the long term, uh, they will make such international, uh, you know, education in, uh, in, in many ways much more sustainable uh, and certainly will bring down the cost uh, that can be a big uh, sort of factor for many students to consider a different destination or to stay at home. Yeah, I, I would just add to that to complement, uh, say, Education USA is the US Department of Commerce, which also puts out 
um, very comprehensive reports on each country and where the growing industries are. Um, and they also take into consideration national plans, right? You know, national budget, strategic plans for nations of where they're going to invest their money in particular fields or industries. And if those align well with the majors that you offer on your campus, that's a sort of a, a, a one indicator that it may be a market, a, a, a good new market for you, and also um, a, a way to to engage a new agent from a different uh, from a different place that you haven't worked before, if you do work with agents. Perfect. Yeah. And my last question: What three countries do you think will be on your hot list in kind of three five years from now? You can kind of pull out your crystal balls and with everything that is changing and all the uncertainties that we have today, what would you say in three to five years, what are your top three countries going to be? I think we're all being shy here. Rob, do you wanna go first? Uh, sure, I, you know, this is a small island country, but I do see uh, a lot of uh, opportunity. It's, it's in uh, the continent of Africa, Mauritius, uh, but, you know, very similar to what I see in South Asia, the South Asian culture, uh, you know, I've been to that part of the world, I think the economy there is extremely strong. Uh, and the fact that you already have institutions from other parts of the world, whether it's Australia or the United Kingdom having a strong presence. Uh, so I do think there's an opportunity there for the United States. Uh, if we can build those right programs. Again, it's a small country, smaller population, uh, but uh, all the indicators seem to be in, in, in a positive direction, I would say. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go back to the drum I've been beating already, uh, but I, I think Nigeria is probably going to continue to see um, some pretty big growth. Uh, again, that financial piece seems to be coming a little bit more into uh, to where they're, as a country, um, able to look at the U.S. As, as an option for more students there. Then obviously demographics. I'm, again, a very young country with a lot of students that are kind of uh, going through that secondary school system and numbers that really the, the tertiary education system there are, are not going to be able to uh, to serve. So I think you'll still have a lot looking outside of the country for uh, for their studies. Perfect. Thank you. Patty? Oh, I'd, yeah, I, I, I would say uh, I've got four, Vietnam, Brazil, India, and uh, China, but maybe in a different kind of way, right? And that maybe we will see more of a proliferation of short-term programs as the number of uh, universities in China continues to increase. And of course, um, their own international rankings of some of those institutions continues to increase, but there might be more opportunity for short-term type programs there. So 